next speaker is um, Joe Trivia. <clears throat> Joe Trivia um, uh, is a senior scientist here at uh, NCAR. Um, and um, Joe um, uh, was the section head before he um, uh, became an emeritus um, of uh, the section I'm in now. Um, and um, uh, there's many things Joe has done. He has made many contributions in many different areas. And uh, I personally think there is not a single top topic he um, has not made uh, a valuable contribution to or does not know the details about. Uh, Joe, please go ahead. I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay. Um, uh, it's very nice to be here, even if it is virtually, but it does give me the opportunity to give a talk in my pajamas. So I, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the organizers for asking me to give a talk. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. And Can you all see it? Can you see the screen? Yes, thank yes, you. Jim. That's great. Okay. Um, okay, so the topic I'm talking about is ensemble prediction. So I really appreciated Will's uh, question on ensemble size because it's really uh, the issue that I'm going to try to uh, elucidate how we get by uh, predicting a large system with uh, really rather small ensemble sizes. So uh, I'll waste no more time with that and just mention that uh, this talk uh, relies on a number of slides I've gathered over the years from some of my friends doing ensemble prediction and they'll be noted on the slides going on. So uh, the outline for the talk is going to be uh, a little bit of background on how uh, we got to probabilistic prediction and ensemble methods, then talk a little bit about uh, the theory behind uh, some of the ways we construct ensembles in medium range forecasting and, and by extension, the ensembles that go into uh, S2S prediction. Uh, then uh, most of those will involve uh, vectors of various types. And then I'll talk a little bit about the successes and limitations of ensemble prediction and talk a little bit about what might be next. So uh, that's the outline. Uh, here we go. So I wanted to mention three people uh, who really made uh, gigantic inroads in the in the area of probabilistic prediction. Um, the first one is uh, Ed Epstein, who was uh, my chairman at the University of Michigan when I was in graduate school. He was chairman of the department. The, the next person was Chuck Leith, who was one of my bosses when I began at NCAR. And uh, the third one is Hank Tenekis, who um, uh, was uh, a visitor at NCAR with whom I interacted uh, many times, but also was um, on the scientific advisory board of the European Center. And his status as uh, a board member uh, allowed him to make some really substantial contributions in getting ECMWF to do ensemble predictions. So let me go through what each one of them did. Ed Epstein fundamentally raised the problem of probabilistic prediction using a dynamical model. And his fundamental approach was, in, was a, a topic known as stochastic dynamic prediction. And stochastic dynamic prediction uh, involved trying to predict the mean or the most likely forecast, the mean forecast, and 
the covariance of that forecast. So both a little bit about uh, the mean of the forecast uh, and the reliability of the forecast, the covariance uh, information associated with the forecast skilling. Okay. And so one of the benefits Epstein found was that by predicting the mean, uh, the error uh, was not as large in an RMS sense uh, than using a deterministic pr prediction. The reason for that, of course, is a deterministic prediction will vary uh, as much as uh, climate, any climate state, any random state drawn from the climatological distribution from the weather after a period of time. So from the difference between the verification and the, the forecast can be as large as uh, two standard deviations or twice the variance of a climate uh, prediction. So the error variance can be twice. If you predict the mean, it only remains one standard deviation or as far away as the, the climatology is. And that's because there's an enormous smoothing that comes in from the mean of a climate distribution, from, from the mean of a forecast, uh, of a probabilistic forecast. And it filters out all the unpredictable aspects of, of a prediction. The next person I wanna, uh, uh, let's go back here. One of the biggest problems was uh, Epstein used uh, a moment um, prediction account. So he predicted the mean equation, for the forecast for the mean indeed gave, um, uh, was uh, an n-dimensional forecast, just like the forecast model. However, for the standard deviation, for the covariance matrix, it's order n squared. So if you have a large, a uh, dynamical model, say a million degrees of freedom, you're talking about n squared or 10 to the 12th degrees of uh, number of degrees of freedom. And that's an impossible computational task. Leith solved that problem by saying, uh, you could try using Monte Carlo samples uh, to predict the mean and get by with order 10 Monte Carlo uh, samples that would give you essentially the same filtering capability of uh, the mean forecast that, um, that Epstein had gotten in the stochastic dynamic prediction studies. Finally, Hank Tenekis uh, doing work in the Netherlands um, and being on the board of the European Center made the bold statement that a no forecast is complete without a forecast of forecast skill. And uh, this actually invigorated the study of ensemble methods for prediction uh, of not only forecast, but of forecast skill, okay? Which means you really have to uh, address this question of the uncertainty in the forecast, the covariance of, of forecast error when you go forward in time. And so this um, research led to ways of using a small number of ensemble elements, despite the fact that you're trying to predict a probability distribution in a gigantic phase space on the order of 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth degrees of freedom. So um, uh, on the face of it, it would seem pretty impossible to get useful 
uh, uncertainty information or uncertainty quantification out of an ensemble of less than 100, say 50, as the European Center is currently using. To illustrate that point, if you had a one dimensional Gaussian distribution, you might need 10 ensemble members to span that. If you went to a two dimensional Gaussian uh, 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 distribution, you might need 100 members to populate uh, that probability distribution and predict it going forward. If you had an n-dimensional space, you might need order 10 to the n, okay? So if n is 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth, this is 10 to, 10 to the eighth. This is an impossible computational uh, burden to address even once. So how do we get around that? Well, what you really want to be doing is predicting the probability distribution um, forward in time. And how do we guarantee that the ensemble uh, that we generate will do a good job of predicting the probability distribution? So I'm going to illustrate, um, give you some theoretical guidance as to how you might want to do that. Okay, so I'm going to try to tackle the large dimension versus small ensemble trade-off uh, by getting some linear theoretical guidance. And in order to do that, we're going to start off with a forecast model. I'm not going to care how large the dimension is, but I am going to make one simplification. We're going to look at uh, a rather tight probability distribution initially, which is uh, the case in uh, prediction. We have relatively small errors at the initial time, so we'd have a relatively tight probability distribution, a, a relatively small uh, <clears throat> standard deviation in, uh, of the ensemble uh, um, elements. Going forward, oh, um, we, we might use the fact then that we would be able to linearize uh, an, uh, the ensemble around a mean or a, or a particular trajectory uh, close to the mean. And um, uh, that uh, would al allow us to make a probability distribution of Z as a, uh, this deviation from the, from, uh, uh, the central trajectory. And that linearized equation for the deviation from that uh, uh, control forecast or um, uh, central forecast is just a, a linear matrix equation. But the linearization is about a mean trajectory. So in here, um, we're embedding not a constant basic state, but a basic state uh, uh, around which we're linearizing, which is a single trajectory of this forecast model. Uh, this being a linear equation, it has a solution in terms of uh, a linear operator. So if we have a particular initial condition for Z, uh, a linear operator takes it from T equals zero to T equal T. And that linear operator depends on this matrix operator A of x0 of t and t. 
for further reference, I want to note that we can also map back from the initial condition from the, the time z equal t condition to our initial condition. And I'm going to call that map z naught of z and t and t. We're going to use that now in the solution of a probability density equation in phase space. So the predictive equation for the probability density in phase space is called the Liouville equation. And it's just the continuity equation for the density in phase space. So just like in fluid mechanics, we have a continuity equation, uh, rho of t uh, plus the divergence of the velocity times the density rho in, in physical space. The same is true by the same mathematical arguments, you get a continuity equation for the probability density in phase space. That probability density uh, can be broken up, uh, that continuity equation can be broken up into two parts. One is an invective part, and the other is this divergence part, this compressive part. And I'm going to call this compressive part, which is a scalar that depends only on t, sigma of t, okay? So with that definition for this compressive part, the divergence in phase space, we can rewrite the probability density in a way that will get rid of the compressive part and leave us only the advective part, okay? And this is the advective part, and we're, we'll predict this renormalized uh, probability phi using this advection equation, phi of t, phi sub t, plus az dot grad z in phi. And this is merely an advection equation in phase space. And the advective velocity is this matrix operator az um, velocity, the velocity of z in phase space. And so to solve this equation, the, the way one does it is to use the method of characteristics. And the method of characteristics says, what I'm going to do is find how um, the, the phi, is carried along the characteristics of this flow. So the characteristics of the flow are given by these two equations, which is merely our dynamical equation, and phi is conserved along that velocity field. So if phi at time t equals zero is some arbitrary function of z, phi at z and t will be that arbitrary uh, function of, of, of z mapped back to the original uh, velocity point. So map back to its initial point. So phi is constant along um, the characteristic curves, and we just map it back to its original point. What does that mean? for a simple initial condition, like a Gaussian. So if we start with a Gaussian, okay, mapping back, we start with a Gaussian with covariance function lambda inverse. So that's our initial Gaussian distribution in Z, so it's Gaussian with zero mean since we've taken out the mean of the, of the Gaussian. At a later time, the, the probability density function is proportional to another Gaussian, uh, a new Gaussian with a different covariance function. And this covariance function is 
given by uh, this transformation of the original covariance function. And the point of my going through all of these is the following. The EOFs of this new probability density um, are the degrees of freedom that have the most variance at a given time. And the EOFs um, of that distribution, the EOFs of this covariance matrix are what are called the singular vectors of um, this linearized dynamical system. The important aspect of this is that in, in this interpretation, the EOFs can form a basis for phase space, a basis for distributing our um, ensemble elements at the initial time. And given that, they give us a, a systematic strategy for uh, constructing an initial ensemble and going forward in time with it. The EOFs at the later time are the evolved singular vectors. So using singular vectors in this form is a, a very strategically logical way of constructing an ensemble. It will construct an ensemble of that will uh, span the most important degrees of freedom in the probability distribution. Let me show you um, so really now the issue with singular vectors and bread vectors are not only a probabilistic perspective, but can be gotten from a different variational perspective. And this is a variational perspective is the one that's typically used to um, to uh, motivate the use of singular vectors. But I, I want to point out that uh, this variational pr uh, perspective that, that uh, is outlined here, where we form the variance at a later time and then try to maximize that variance, look for degrees of freedom, which grow the most rapidly, kind of um, emphasizes much more so uh, singular vectors as dangerous degrees of freedom, whereas the, the Liouville the equation, linearized Liouville equation motivates uh, singular vectors much more as a natural basis for the PDF of a system. So, um, basically, from Rayleigh Ritz, uh, the variational problem here with the constraint, uh, the initial condition norm equal to one, excuse me, uh, motivates an eigenvalue problem uh, using the Rayleigh Ritz criterion. And this is the the eigenvalue problem that you would get. And the eigenvalue problem uh, can either be solved as what are the most dangerous degrees of freedom looking forward or the most dangerous degrees of freedom uh, that have grown from the past. And in the first case, moving forward, you have singular vectors as implemented by the European Center. And as you, if you think of them as uh, the most dangerous degrees of, of freedom uh, growing up until the present time, then you motivate um, bread vectors as implemented originally by NSEP in their ensemble system. Okay, moving on. So this is, as I said, uh, 
the motivation of um, bread vectors or singular vectors uh, moving forward in time, start off with a small circular um, PDF. And at some later time, the linearized dynamic stretches the PDF in the degrees of freedom that are the most dangerous. Or uh, looking at it this way, uh, the EOFs of this original probability distribution become the EOFs of this, the principal axis of this ellipsoidal um, uh, covariance. And the, the leading EOF is the one that explains the most variance uh, and is um, stretched out along this elongated degree of freedom here. All right. Actually, at the European Center, uh, a much more general eigenvalue problem is solved to compute their EOFs, which involves uh, uh, weighting them with various um, initialization uh, weightings and finalization weightings, which give you a slightly different um, uh, a slightly different um, eigenvalue problem than the one I portrayed on the previous slide. And really what it has to do with using uh, norms, metric norms uh, that might be different at the initial time and the final time. But basically you're solving an eigenvalue problem uh, just as I, I pointed out there which once again, diagonalizes the covariance matrix. And that, that's um, a different perspective than the most dangerous degrees of freedom perspective. And I want to, want to uh, emphasize that. All right, so what's the difference between bread vectors and singular vectors? So I, I constructed a very simple example in which uh, a baroclinic channel with a localized baroclinic jet at one end is perturbed and the singular vectors are found and the bread vectors are found for each of them. So the singular vector here is this structure and the bread vector uh, that's constructed is this structure down below. And as you can see, you get exactly what you uh, might consider uh, as being uh, the, the necessary aspects of these vectors. This singular vector in time is going to evolve into a very dangerous degree of freedom. It's going to look very much like this structure, bread vector below when it evolves. This singular vector looks very much like uh, a adjoint mode associated with a normal mode that might look like this. So this is uh, another aspect, you should, uh, a way of thinking about singular vectors. They're really much like the adjoint structures that will most effectively grow into um, degrees of freedom that will look like unstable structures, uh, unstable baroclinic waves in this case, and look like um, uh, covariance structures uh, that evolve into realistic uncertainties at the final time. Okay, so singular vectors are also very useful for picking out um, aspects of the flow that will be uncertain and grow in the future time. So uh, I constructed some um, model error states uh, that were gotten using a fraternal twin uh, of that same evolved, evolving baroclinic flow that I showed on the previous time. And this is what the error growth of 
uh, backscatter looks like um, uh, at the initial time or the beginning of, of a, uh, very early into um, the forecast. And the leading singular vectors do very effectively pick out areas where these error grow, these uh, error grows in, in this system. Uh, I should say, should point that uh, back the other way and say the error grows in this system where the singular vectors suggest they ought to grow because these are the most ticklish degrees of freedom, the most um, delicate degrees of freedom, the ones that will uh, give you uh, the most dangerous growth going forward in time. Okay, so uh, the point of doing all these things in terms of uh, finding um, uh, exotic or dynamically constrained ways of finding initial conditions for uh, a smallish ensemble is that predictability is flow dependent, okay? The uncertainty structure on a given day is going to vary from one day to the next. One day, the region of uncertainty um, will be very large, okay, show very large uncertainty. Whereas on an earlier day, you might see very tight correspondence um, of ensemble members. And so no predictability growth. So this region here is a very certain region for the 500 millibar height field. Whereas at a later time, this region in here is a very uncertain uh, region for the, the predictability. And singular vectors do a very good job of picking out that uncertainty. They also do a very good job of spanning the kinds of weather that might exist on a particular day. You can see these are different ensemble members from the European Center at uh, 32 hours. And, uh, or excuse me, at 10 days. And what you can see is very large, very large deviations uh, of the ensemble members from one another, showing very great forecast uncertainty. Excuse me, this is uh, at uh, six days, not 32 hours or. 10 days. This, this is six day forecast. You can see there's a wide variety of, of forecast uh, realizations that might exist. And so uh, the ensemble has a good chance of being representative at that time. Show you a case where it came in handy in the medium range uh, is a forecast of a famous Lothar storm at 48 hour, 42 hours. And this is the deterministic prediction. This was the verification, uh, a very much deeper trough. And as you can see, the ensemble generated not only troughs that deep, but in some cases, troughs even deeper, showing how strong and how um, uncertain this forecast is. But it did give a hint of the kind of extreme weather that was possible um, for uh, this particular time in which there was indeed some extreme weather did occur. Um, two points I wanna mention before uh, I quit because my time is just over. Um, uh, turns out, uh, a method called random field uh, perturbations works nearly as well as some of these dynamically constrained methods. And to show you that, here's an initial um, fork, forecast uncertainty field for the 500 millibar height field. Um, 
constructed using singular vectors, random field vectors, and ensemble transform vectors, which is pretty close to bread vectors. And this is the estimate um, for the uh, initial uncertainty. You can see uh, random field does a good job of picking up the, the, the initial uncertainty. And in terms of the evolved ensemble forecast, does a good job of picking up the error, uh, um, the actual error or the uncertainty uh, of the forecast in the future time. So, however, one aspect is, that is deficient in almost all forecasts is that uh, ensemble predictions in and of themselves are not um, representative. They don't uh, yeah, do a good job of predicting the forecast error uh, beyond about two days in time, okay? So they're, they're deficient in error variance at two days in time. And the only way, to, this is shown also from a rank histogram diagram in which um, uh, the probability of occurrence is of the atmosphere is actually outside the range of the forecast as shown by uh, the most populated uh, histogram state are the wings of the distribution, showing the, the, there's not enough variance in the ensemble. And the only way around that is to add some stochastic forcing, which is the whole, a whole topic of another talk. And uh, um, we will end there only by stating that you uh, some means of um, emulating forecast errors, model forecast errors, uh, is needed in order to get repre representative ensembles at the medium range and certainly at the ASDAST range. So I'm going to close there uh, with the following conclusions. Probabilistic uh, predictions require solutions to the model dimension ensemble size problem. Singular bread and random field vectors solve this problem well, fairly well. Error prediction is representative at about two to three days, but not longer. Missing variance from model errors must be accounted for by um, model stochastic terms or perturbed parameters. Large ensembles, ensemble data, uh, uh, ensemble data assimilation methods are being explored to help uh, uh, minimize the impact of these errors. And all of this in my talk was focused on the atmosphere. But uh, it goes without saying that these techniques need to be explored out into the uh, coupled model domain. So I, I'll end there and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. So what Joe just did is he summarized at least 60 years of the uh, theory of uh, predictability in chaotic systems as well as representing forecast uncertainty uh, uh, in ensemble prediction systems in 30 minutes. Thanks so much, Joe.